Sorry. You, Joaquim, where are you heading? Well, actually, I don't know, and I don't care too much about that anymore. But you don't know where you're going. How can you do that? The, the problem really lies in that uh, earlier uh, you really could know as a business where you were going. And I think uh, what we're seeing right now is that the, the planning horizon really becomes shorter and shorter. So even though I would like to ask my business stakeholders on where is the business going, I can't get that answer anymore. Simply put, nobody knows. Nobody knows where market is going. Nobody knows where technology is going. And in order to actually be able to react on that, you need to start thinking totally differently. So the goal, the end goal, is actually not important anymore. Do you mean that you can't run large programs like you did before? Well, actually, I could argue that you couldn't run them even a couple of years ago. What I've been seeing for many of my big clients is really big programs failing all over the place. Uh, so I think it's, this is nothing that started happening this week or something. It's really been going on for quite some while. The problem, of course, lies in that the methodologies and the approaches that most corporations are having is really based on some kind of assumptions that you could understand uh, what you're go going to do, some kind of goal understanding, drive that for a couple of years uh, in a more or less linear way and then deliver what you said you would deliver. Frankly, that failed 10 years ago. How does this impact enterprise architecture? So essentially the basic problem when it goes to classical enterprise architecture is really about the, the presumption that you could predict the future, that you would know five years from now, ten years from now, what would be needed. More or less vague, but essentially that you would assume that you could predict that. So what I'm seeing right now is that the, the, the planning horizon, the, num the number of weeks, months, years of in, in, into the future where you can plan is becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. And at the same time, even though the, the speed of manufacturing solutions, uh, given that you have uh, cloud solutions on, gets faster, it's still coming to the point where the planning horizon started to touch the, the production horizon and perhaps even surpassing it. So this is a totally new paradigm where you can't really approach the problems as we did the last 10 years or so. How can you avoid going in the wrong direction and falling into the water? Well, frankly I can't in a way. But you know, the, the problem really lies in that when you had a model where you try to define the, the end state, you, you got an all-in situation. It's what's a bit, little bit like roulette. You put all uh, the effort on, on one single number and then full effort in doing that thing. I think we could approach it a little bit like a venture capitalist. You know, if you start up 10 projects, nine would fail. And actually, that's not a problem because what you learn is a value by itself. Even though you only weed out the, the one single project that actually was the gold nugget you were looking for, you couldn't know that from to begin with. You needed to start up 10 things just to be able to understand which was a good one. And also the nine failed projects is not a failure by itself. You learn something as an organization. And that's a very good value by itself. But this is a very different perspective compared to what we are used to see. Yeah, it is. Uh, in a sense, I mean, this is not too new. We have been talking about Agile. Agile has kind of this approach in a way. Uh, if we talk about DevOps even more, and especially if we talk about the things that many organizations right now is doing about large-scale autonomous uh, DevOps, if you don't understand that you need to take a totally different perspective here, I think it will fail. Uh, and I've seen quite a few big organizations really not understanding that they want agility, they want the total autonomy, and they want this flexibility in, in the landscape. At the same time, they're putting in controls and really hard constraints. So you must understand that agile is actually anti-control in a way. You need to allow for freedom in, in the organization. And that includes the freedom for search on an individual level, on a service level, team level, for the best path forward. If you think you can control that top down, especially if you talk about hundreds of teams, which some organizations is talking about, even thousands of teams, you will fail. Sorry. This will be a huge change to organization and the roles therein. Definitely. Uh, I mean, I see some quite radical changes in some organizations. I mean, people are talking about going from perhaps 60, 70 roles in the IT organization or the delivery organization down to something like 12. So obviously, Lots of mid-level management and so on 
goes away in this kind of structure. Uh, a part of autonomy is really putting the power very close to execution. And that, of course, means that what we traditionally saw as, as middle management and also lots of overhead goes away. What impact would this have for an enterprise like you? There are people saying this, that there are two kinds of architects. There are the people, uh, the architects that uh, do coding and there are the architects not needed. I don't really agree about that. Uh, for sure, even though you think about this scenario, but you're trying to plan for unplannable, or you try to, to drive the, the large scale things, that still supplies. And there is, a, there is a kind of strange situation, I would say, when it goes to DevOps and Agile. People tend to think that when you do Agile, you don't need architecture anymore. That just solves itself magically. But that's not true. The point being that the more agile you want to be, the more control you want in some senses. You need to define a couple of things. And in order to an agile organization to actually move forward, there needs to be somebody paving the way. You can't jump into the bumps in the road and you can't just uh, go into the rocks in the road, whatever is there. You need to have somebody taking that away. And because, and this is again one of the really misunderstandings I see many times, people don't really understand the effect of time. So even though you have somebody in your organization understanding that there is a problem you need to solve, until that actually is solved, it will still take time. So agile teams mostly looking on their feet, look at the ground where they're standing, they need to understand that you really have to have some part of the organization that prepares for whatever is coming up. You need standards, you need guidelines, you need platforms, you need other stuff as well, for sure. What about preparations? You are aware of the climate and brought a jacket with you. Of course. I mean, when you talk about these situations, it's not like you don't plan, it's not like you don't prepare. And uh, perhaps it's, that is it's exactly the opposite. You need to prepare. And the paradigm I'm most normally using here is really about platforms. One thing is being able to utilize platforms, and that could be cloud platforms, could be other, other kind of platforms, but also creating platforms. So it's really about being able to stand on the shoulders of other people and allowing other people to stand on your shoulders. So, of course, again, preparing is totally essential. Otherwise, I mean, you could end easily end up in a situation where you say, we are agile, but agile meaning totally ad hoc. And ad hoc will not take you to, the, to whatever goal you're trying to, to get to, I can assure you. I don't know where we are heading, but I'm not worried. It's just like a walk in a park. But business changes are more complex. Yeah, well, considering complexity as, as a theme here, of course, complexity doesn't go away at all. Uh, one of the benefits with this kind of approach is that if you go from having a, a view that you drive programs and you drive projects, uh, going into more of a product mode, meaning that you actually need to take wall-to-wall -wall full life cycle responsibility for a product. And that includes also things like complexity. So having a responsibility for actually de decreasing complexity and simplifying, that is absolutely one part of, of a product team's ownership. And that includes things like refactoring, includes things like testing and testability and many of the non-functional requirements that often is forgotten. And really what you must understand is that if you have a project organization, what is viewed from kind of an, an, a product architect or perhaps the, the product manager's point of view as waste, that is actually overhead and value for somebody else. So really understanding a simple thing like documentation would be a waste from a product point of view, but that has huge value if you take one step back and look at the product. So really complexity needs to be solved, but you can't take the full complexity. It's really down to a product or a service level and having the full lifecycle ownership and full lifecycle responsibility of that, then you need to cater for complexity and the reduction of that over time. Can you give some examples of non-functional requirements that are important today? Well, a very simple example would be the ability to change. Just measuring the time from that you have some kind of request until you've been able to do that change, that's a very specific requirement. Could you give another example? One example would be reusability. We have been talking about reuse in this industry for, I think, 25 years. But this is something else. We need to step that up quite significantly. Uh, Looking at REST as an, as an uh, paradigm, everybody heard about REST services, and really going for REST level 3 and HAL, uh, hypertext application language, that's an example where you actually can start talking about reusability for sure. And really, the point here is that they, you need to define the APIs outside in to begin with, and they need to be totally open-ended. If you create something like is essentially just a point-to-point -point integration that you happen to wrap in a REST interface, 
sorry guys, but you have misunderstood it totally. So it's really not about technology here, it's really about what viewpoint do you take as a designer or an architect and what kind of open-endedness are you allowing for? So it's the outside in perspective and the user perspective. And the user in this case being the person that is consuming your services, the programmer, the developer doing that. If you understand that you can create a solution which is really easy to consume, then you've succeeded. Are there any other aspects than complexity that we need to take care of? Yeah, obviously. Uh, looking at the VUCA paradigm, uh, the A, ambiguous, uh, is really about we are going in directions where you totally haven't been before as an organization. You don't really want to make out of it. And just an example, I mean, a project I'm doing right now uh, with one of my key clients is really where we are seeking inspiration from theaters, from museums, from totally different arenas where we've been before. And this is really understanding that the team cannot solve the problem with our own knowledge, with our own experience. We really need to bring in people with totally different aspects here. And I think that's totally important that bringing in new people with new viewpoints, with new experiences, that will help you. Don't think you can solve new problems with the old knowledge. Do you need other skills or a different mindset? Skills is one thing, but I think that very much of what we're talking about in a VUCA environment is really about mindset and understanding that this is new circumstances that need new approaches and totally new ways of thinking. How big changes can you do in a program then? Think like you're building a, a railway and then you have to build a new road for the cars instead. I think the first mistake here is to talk about the program, of course. Uh, this is really not a way of driving things forward. But I would say that given the right preparation and given the right platform thinking, you can go quite far. And without talking about too much detail here, I mean, uh, I'm right now actually in, in, in a way that we, we are today. This is uh, mid-October. And in April, uh, we will launch live a totally new capability for one of my clients. And this is something which we today view as completely possible. We have been preparing, we have a great set of platforms to stand on, and going in, into a totally different direction where this client has never been before, it is actually realistic. So it's quite drastical, uh, but given new insights or in how we work, how we approach the problems, I'm quite confident we will succeed. What about stakeholder expectations? I think that the first really important thing in this new mode is understanding that a stakeholder cannot be external. If you have a stakeholder far away from your product or from your project, whatever you're doing, you will have a huge effort in keeping that person happy. The success really lies in that stakeholders need to be part of both the problem definition but certainly also the solution. So talking about business and IT as different entities that have some kind of collaboration, that won't fly. It's really about having an end-to-end -end responsibility from a business point of view, from a delivery point of view, really wall-to-wall, -wall, full life cycle, and that includes also the business aspects. So stakeholders that are important to drive a solution forward will need to be part of the solution team. Otherwise, I think you really will have a struggle going forward. Yeah, so one of the preconditions is a bridge between business and IT then? Or even not a bridge, but even further that IT and business is the same. Talking about IT and business alignment, if you haven't done that alignment by now, you have a challenge.